Hello, my name is Amanda, and I am a Waray beekeeper, but all my bees are dead. Okay, let's talk about what happened. Welcome to another episode of I Demand a Homestead. My name is Amanda, um, and I am privileged to be a Waray beekeeper, and I absolutely love keeping bees. I've got a few other videos on what's great about a worry hive and um, and how to kind of <clears throat> and how to manage your worry hive but today is a more difficult video for me to make um, I we had a little bit of warmer weather earlier this week and I was able to come out and check on my beehives and and I do that periodically anyway um, in the winter, but I was able to actually kind of look at them a little bit more closely and open them up and I discovered that both hives are dead. Anybody who keeps bees will eventually have a hive that dies. Uh, and it, it's a horrible thing. We owe it to ourselves to keep trying to keep bees. We also need to figure out what happened so that that way, if we can, it doesn't happen again. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to pull apart these two different hives and try and figure out why they didn't make it through the winter. So when we think about kind of what they call dead outs, winter dead outs, there's usually three different reasons. Uh, one of three different reasons, or it can be a combination of them. One is food. So they didn't have enough food and they starved to death. Uh, the second is environmental things. So things like, um, you had a really cold winter, really long winter. Maybe you had temperatures that kind of went up and down because if the temperature goes up, the bees can break apart from their cluster. And then if the temperature drops too quickly, they can't cluster back up again, and then they may freeze to death. Um, and if that happens more, more and more over time, it can reduce the number of bees in your hive until the, the cluster just isn't big enough to stay warm. The other thing that can be a problem is moisture. Um, so if it gets too wet inside the hive, because as the bees are eating the honey, it actually does generate moisture inside the hive. And if there isn't any kind of way for that moisture to dissipate, then it may get too wet. And then wet honeybees are dead honeybees because they just can't stay warm. And the third thing is some kind of pest, um, whether that is mice, it can be shrews getting in there to eat your bees. Um, it can be mites or it could be viruses. Okay, so what if you guys watched my videos before, you'll know that this was my new hive. Um, I put in a new cluster um, a bee package in spring last year. Um, and this hive never really got that strong. I okay, so this hive is my older one and it was really, really strong going into the winter. So All right, so. Um, on my worry hive, and this is kind of, it's a little bit icy now today, but this is a, a mouse guard. Um, and it's a metal one, which is super important because mice are damaging in that they'll get into your hive and they'll, they'll burrow through the comb and make nests and make a mess. Um, but more importantly around here, um, if you have shrews, shrews will get inside your hive and they will eat your bees. All right. And then, Throughout the winter, they'll just keep coming back every, you know, day or so, and they'll come and eat more bees. So if in the spring you have a dead hive and you see a lot of um, bees that are that are missing their heads or the, or the heads are separated from the abdomens, very likely you had a shrew in here. Okay, so you got to make sure you put on those metal mouse guards and you can buy special ones for worry hives. Normally in the winter time, when the days are a little bit warmer above freezing, you should see a collection of dead bees um, in the front of the hive. And that's normal because bees die throughout the winter. And then when it's warm enough, the, um, the undertaker bees um, will, will kind of either, if they can, they'll bring them outside the hive. But if they can't, they'll just kind of bring them to the entrance. And then usually what I do every week or so, as I'll come by with my little, and I'll take off the mouse guard, and I just kind of pull them away from there so that that way the entrance is open. Okay. All right. And this hive, I noticed almost right off the bat, 
probably in December, that there were no dead bees, which made me really worry about them. That's, those are the ones where you don't see dead bees in the winter that you have, really have to get concerned, okay? So, okay, so first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this top box here, um, and this hive had drawn comb in this box and a whole box full of honey up here. So the first thing I'm going to do is kind of heft them and kind of see whether there's still honey in here. And this box is really heavy, okay? Um, so it's full of honey. And I don't see the cluster anywhere. Second box. Again, I don't see a cluster anywhere. Okay, so here is the first box there that I said was drawn comb. That's pretty much what it is. They didn't really get a lot of honey in here just because I said they weren't very strong. And you can see there's no cluster. <clears throat> Here's the cluster. And it's tiny. Really tiny. Um, this dark comb, they obviously used it for brood. But that cluster wouldn't have been big enough to survive the winter. There's no way. Okay, so here are dead bees on the bottom board here. Um, and there's not that many of them. So it may just be that uh, the bees really had a small population going into winter. And if I look at these bees, you can see that they all have their heads, right? So no shrew. There's a little bit of water in here, but I don't know how long this hive has been dead for. So I don't think, there's not that much water though. So I don't think it was a moisture problem. Um, and then we're gonna look for mites right there. That's a mite. There's another one. So that, so we got some evidence of mites in here. Yeah, there's another one there. Okay, there's a few of them. So they obviously had mites, which again can weaken them. And so the other thing we can look for is um, evidence of viruses, okay? So, because viruses can, uh, mites can transmit viruses and those can weaken the bees and make the winter bees die faster. So things that you would be looking for would be bees with misshapen wings, um, bees with really short abdomens, or um, bees that are kind of shiny and hairless. All right. Okay, so here are some of the dead bees off my hive. Um, I don't see any misshapen wings. I don't see any kind of greasy looking bees that look hairless. What I do see are bees with short abdomens. So if we look at um, this one in particular, where, 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 oops, this one right here, okay? The wings should be, the abdomen should be longer than the wings, all right? Or just about the same length. And you can see quite clearly this bee, that abdomen is shorter than those wings. Now, of course, it's dead, so probably would have been a little bit longer in life, but um, a lot of them have got short abdomens. There you can see another one there, okay? So I suspect that these bees were, were had, we, we see evidence of varroa, we see evidence of short abdomens. It was a weak hive to begin with. We know they still have honey. There's not too much moisture in the hive. So I think this was a weak cluster with a varroa infestation that went into a winter that was actually not that hard. Um, and they, they, they died because of that. Here's the second hive and you can see it's got a mouse guard on it as well. Actually had lots of kind of dead bees kind of throughout the season being accumulated on this bottom, this entrance here. And so I was just coming along and scraping them off and scraping them off. Um, like more than normal though, it's normal to see dead bees. Uh, but these guys had a lot more than they should. Um, they were just dying off too quickly. You can kind of see there's like piles of them down here on the ground in front of the hive. And I'm always moving them out of the way because you want to make sure that your bees can come out um, when it warms up to do cleansing flights because the bees won't, um, won't poop inside their hive, okay? So you always want to make sure that you're clearing those out, clearing snow out of the way too. Um, so this was my big hive and it didn't make it either. So 
let's pull it apart and see if we can find out why. Okay, so here we are. I took off the uh, the top parts. So first thing we're going to do is the same as the other one. We're going to... I've split these boxes open. I think I did. Yes, I did. So I'm going to half this box. Oh, and it's heavy. It's full of honey. So they didn't starve. Okay, so that's kind of step one. Um, I'll flip it over so I can see if there's a cluster in here. Lots and lots of dead bees. Okay, so you can kind of see where I've been kind of scraping away bees from the front entrance. That's why there's none there. But there's just a lot of them. So, and again, we'll... Um, I don't see any um, excess moisture here um, because there would be like actual standing water. I don't see any of that. I don't see any mold either, but I haven't left this hive that long since the last time I knew they were okay. Um, so if you've left your hive for a long time, you may have mold on there, on the bees, and that's not a sign necessarily of excessive moisture. Um, so I don't think this was a moisture problem. Uh, I don't think it was a starvation problem. Okay, so let's take a look now and see if there's anything we can see in the bees themselves. I don't see any mites on the bottom board here. So what we'll do is we'll take a look at the bees themselves. All the bees still have heads attached. So again, I don't think um, shrews were a problem. And I have um, very carefully watched out for those too, because I had a problem with them one year. So here are a few of our dead bees. Um, I don't see any that are kind of hairless looking or greasy. Um, incidentally, I don't see that many that have short abdomens either. So if we kind of look, uh, if I bring them nice and close, like this one right here, you can see that the abdomen is longer than the wings. Um, this one maybe is a little bit short. This one's definitely not. Not that you'd see it in all of them, but, um, yeah, there's one that's got a short abdomen right there. I don't see any real evidence of wing deformities either. Maybe some that have got shortened abdomens. Um, and I don't see any mites, but that doesn't mean that they're not there. Okay. Here is, this is the top box, um, and I don't see any bees in there, so I don't think they made it up into that box. There is some brood, capped brood here actually. Whoa, they did some super funky stuff here with building this comb, which is cool. You can kind of see why it's hard for a beekeeper to um, pull the frames out of these and examine the bees because they just build it how they want to build it. I love that about the Warray Hive, that they build it the way, the way they want to, but it does make inspections <laughs> difficult. And there are a few scattered patches of bees. There's some here, kind of see them clustered in together. There's some here and there's some here. So, and yeah, they're kind of scattered all over the place. So we did have an up and down winter. So what may have happened is these clusters got divided because they were, they spread apart when it all got warm. And then we had a quick drop in temperatures, which we totally had. And then these bees just couldn't find each other again. So they clustered up together in smaller clusters. And those small clusters just wouldn't be enough to keep them warm. Like, yeah. Ay, ay, ay. Okay, let's take out a frame um, where we see that brood and see what it looks like. So here, here's the last remains of the cluster. You can see the dotted queen. Nowhere near enough bees to keep them warm. And then if we look down here, we can see a spotty brood pattern. 
And here's actually a bee, a bee that was trying to emerge and just wasn't strong enough to actually emerge. So that's pretty damning evidence of mites. If you look, I don't know if you can see it, but there's some crystallized white chunkies that probably are mite poop. So I think it's safe to say um, that this purple hive was a weak hive going into the winter. Why that was, um, they didn't really ever build up the way they way I expected them to. That might have been because they had a weak queen. Uh, might have been because they already had a mite infestation. Um, and then they obviously did have mites, and that would mean that their small cluster would die off even faster. And then they just wouldn't, they didn't run out of food, they just didn't have enough bees to survive the winter. Different story for this hive over here, which was really, really strong. Uh, apparently the strong hives are the ones that kind of, unfortunately, because the, those mites, they breed inside the capped cells. Um, those strong hives actually can have higher levels of, of mites, and we do see evidence of mites in both hives. Um, not so much on the bottom board, but definitely kind of evidence of that brood pattern and, um, and then the, the little kind of mite poop on either side. So I have learned a valuable lesson here. Um, if you watch my first video about, about worry beekeeping, I say that um, because it's less stress to the bees, they're, they're able to manage the mites themselves, or they seem to be. And that may, that may not be entirely true, okay? So I think it's important that we as beekeepers be able to admit that if we've kind of made mistakes, that we don't kind of stay fastened to our philosophy about how we're gonna do something. So I think I need to change what I'm doing. But what I'm actually going to do differently um, this coming next next beekeeping season is I'm going to get a screened bottom board, um, which which you can get for Warre hives the same way that you would for Langstroth hives. I'm going to get screened bottom boards for both of my hives so that that way um, I can put the sticky paper down on there and I can monitor the mite populations a little bit better. Can't my monitor the mite populations as well as you would in a Langstroth hive because you clearly see you can't take the frames out all that well. So I can't I can't do that kind of looking for the brood stuff that I did today in a worry hive because it's too damaging it's just it would be really really bad so but I am going to try and kind of monitor for the mites a little bit more carefully um, so that that way I can know if I actually do have to treat them right because if I have to treat them um, and that is going to be what ensures the survival of my bees then that's what I will do, okay? I know they're trying to breed bees that are more resistant to mites, um, but until that time, you know, because this is an invasive species, if I have to, if I have to treat them, I'm going to try and use the most organic methods um, I can that are effective. So I'm going to do research on that and then try and decide what's most appropriate. Okay, so I'm going to do that differently. Um, the other thing that I probably would have done differently is with this hive that I knew was weak, um, I would probably kind of cut my losses in the, in the fall and combine this hive with the strong one. Uh, because at least that would have given the clusters a better chance and they would have higher numbers. Okay, even with a, a mite infestation, they might well have, eh, they might well have done better. Okay, so... But I'm not giving up because with the world the way it is now, everybody, the world needs beekeepers. Uh, the, world's need, the world needs honeybees because they're responsible for, I think it's a third of all the food that we produce. Or is it two thirds? I'm not sure. But it's a lot, right? Because of pollination. And with all the pesticides and everything else that's happening and the changing climate, we need to help these bees as best we can. And so I'm not gonna give up being a beekeeper even though I've had this, this setback, okay? Look for me again, getting more bees, starting over and trying to do things a little bit better each time. All right, thank you for joining me on another episode of I Demand a Homestead and we'll see you again next time. All right, bye-bye.